Tamarck Chadbourne describes the fantasy, fantasy genre by saying that fantasy genre starts where science ends. In an age of technology and science, why do we as a society still hold fascination with vampires and werewolves? To explore this and more, stay tuned to Women's AM. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. You have tuned in this morning to Women's AM. We have a great lineup for you sisters today. We will be looking at an interesting range of news articles to keep you informed of what's going on. Discuss what the deal is with the fantasy genre in popular culture. And lastly, we will be looking at some pieces of work from Sister Sultana. We also have our usual competition, so stay tuned with details on how you can enter. I'm your host, Adam, and on today's panel, we have Sister Shaheen. Zainab and our guest for today, Sister Sultana Parvin. Salam alaikum, you guys. Alaikum. How are you lot? Mashallah. Well, I brought in something for you guys to try, and it's a snack that takes me way back to my childhood. Um, it's a West African snack called Chin Chin. Sounds a bit weird. <laughs> but it's basically made up of flour, sugar, um, water, margarine, um, and it's really, really tasty. It's, it's one of those snacks that, for me personally, when I start I keep going on and on and on with it, so I just wanted to see what you guys think Is of it. Reason why it's called Chin Chin? I really don't know. It's it's a it's a West African name, but it's it's really funny play on name. Mashallah. And it's really yeah, crunchy. It's really it's crunchy as well. It's basically biscuit. Yeah, mm. it's basically biscuit, and it's all natural really ingredients. Yummy. Really nice it cup smells, of hot tea. It smells lovely. It mm. actually mm. does. When you yeah. really sort of like get in the, mm. the, the smell of it, it's, it's really really beautiful and mm. yummy. So you can have it in the morning. Um, in the and this in would be good with a nice night. hot cup of tea. Mm. 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 After yeah, the show, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but normally it's a lot more softer than than what I have here, and you can have it in different shapes as well. Mm -hmm. But this is normally the, the shape that a lot of people tend to make it in. And I think you have to really mold the, the, the ingredients together and then sort of heat it at a very, very high... High temperature. High, high temperature, so well, that's what gives it its sort of taste as well. Mm. Which is really beautiful, mashallah. So, inshallah, enjoy it throughout the show, inshallah. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go straight to our first segment of the date news bites. In this segment, we keep you informed with feature stories and articles. And if you would like to join in this discussion and tell us what you think of the stories of the day, please call the number on the screen. So I'm going to start with you, Sister Shahina, on the first article that we have. Yep. The first one we have from The Guardian. What on earth is a death cafe? That's the headline. What on earth is a death cafe? Uh, this, is, this is actually a really, really interesting idea, considering the fact that, you know, society today, we don't really talk about death. It's, it's something uncomfortable to talk about. But th this guy, he um, set up the first death cafe in Edinburgh, up north, and um, it's doing really well. But the whole reason he talks about setting it up is because, um, forget about even uh, talking about death, people find it uncomfortable just with the idea of talking about death. Mm. And he couldn't understand why when it's uh, such an important event in our life and the something without, without a doubt will happen. Something that will happen in our life. So why is it that we can't talk about it? So mm. he set up this cafe over tea and cake. People come together and talk about um, death and what it means and you know, what it means to other people, how to make the best out of life. Um, you know, all the questions that are giving people the opportunity to actually ask the questions without making people feel uncomfortable or without coming across really morbid. Mm. Well, I, I you know, when I actually first heard about this concept of a death cafe, I thought it was really a gory setting mm. in some sort of run-down cafe and it's really haunting, subhanAllah. Yeah. But it isn't exactly like that. It's really just a normal meeting where people talk about something which, as you said, is inevitable. What do you think about it? It's a natural thing. thing. I think yeah. it's interesting because Adama says something quite interesting, which is that when you think, first think of the idea, because they're such a, we live in such a fad society, yeah. first of all, you might think it's a fad, right? So he's probably got coffins everywhere and what have you. But actually what he's encouraging is discussion. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. And it's done in a setting which is maybe slightly different. But it's a very normal thing for us to discuss these issues. And it is such an integral part of existence, mm -hmm. which is that every human being will suffer death. Um, and giving the opportunity for human beings to have those discussions, understand greatly their purpose of life as a consequence of, you know, then, then you know, if, de if death occurs and what's the purpose of our existence, yeah. I think is something that we as Muslims naturally encourage. 
but I think it's considered weird and the reason why it's probably in the newspapers is because it's considered so taboo to discuss it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very encouraging that you know people are taking it on board themselves to have those kind of discussions, it's absolutely. I think Definitely. it's good that it's encouraged because people feel, I find that as soon as you raise the issue, people just shut down like, okay, I don't want to hear about it. Yeah. Kind of thing. I think this provides that platform. Yeah. I think it, it's actually quite interesting that we actually need a platform to be provided in the yeah. first place. It's something that's so natural. Mm -hmm. Question about where we came from, why we're here, where we're going. It's natural, it's part I mean, of life. One of the reasons why a lot of people don't do tend to shut down whenever they, they hear about death is simply because from their perspective it's it's entering into the world of the unknown. Mm. I think one of the reasons why for us as Muslims it's easier to talk about death is because we understand what yes. death the, what the purpose of death is, we know what the purpose of life is yes. and we know what we what we could meet in the akhirah. Yes. So it's a lot easier to take in death as well but yes. it's definitely a very interesting mm. um, a sort of interesting sort of setup here, mashallah. Yeah. So, Sister Zain, have you got our second article? Yes, from The Guardian. Uh, binge drinking women are Britain's uh, litmus test. Um, this is a really interesting article um, talking about drinking culture and the focus that uh, women seem to primarily get with this whole issue. So, binge, the binge drinking culture is something that is widely discussed from men, women, and uh, even the youth, the teenagers that are kind of partaking in this. But normally, if you, she was making a point, and I think this is a very good point, if you go on Google and you do a little search for um, binge drinking, the pictures that will come up will be, you know, women stumbling mm -hmm. around in the streets or like. Uh, you know, unconscious on the floor, that kind of thing. So the focus is really mainly on women. So even uh, comments um, uh, from uh, was it the police commissioner uh, Julia um, Mugalian, um saying that uh, binge drinking uh, basically is a, is a huge problem in their um, in, a, in their area, and that women are very vulnerable to exploitation and issues like in, that. In Yorkshire, or that yeah. particular area. Yeah. yeah. So that was her take on on her area, definitely. Um, but it's just interesting that, that she's talking about this as a historical issue as well, how this is an unfair depiction of women mm. and how it's actually a historical thing. There was a, a, a she's given you know, an explanation a while ago, there was this, um, a similar concern. Um, and that what it comes down to is that societies often uh, measure their morality on the state of their women mm. and what the women tend to, tend to you know, exhibit as behavior. Mm. Um, so men can behave how they want, yeah. but when the women do these yeah. things, when they do the kind of the, the bad actions or whatever, yeah. um, then this is something that, that is a problem. And I thought this was, um, she was actually making a really good point. It's yeah. quite interesting. She takes us back in time because as a student of history, one of the, the things yeah. that I realized when it came down to society and how women were seen as, as a woman, you had to um, have mm. a very puritanical yes. kind of uh, sort of appearance before people. Um, you had to be very modest, mm. softly spoken. You had to learn certain etiquettes and manners, particularly if you were, if you were if you were, if you belong to the upper class or mm. the middle class, for example, this was very very important, yeah. and it's quite interesting that she's kind of given the sort of parallel how now today mm. we find that when we look at some of the issues that we face as a society, women are at the forefront and they are not depicted in the most respectable manner. Mm. So that's yeah. quite interesting for panel like. Uh, you know, you can take this further. You know, the the obsession that the West seems to have with the East, the East has with the West. When you yeah. go home, what happens? Everyone wants to talk about who the women. The women what the yeah. women do? What do? How do they dress? How do they behave? Yeah. What, you know, what kind of things do they get involved in? Um, and I agree with her that you can't measure society based. You can't put that all on women. Yeah, that oh, okay, saying, yeah. you know, women, you have to sort yourselves out, and then everything yeah. will will fix itself up. Yeah. But what I think is an interesting point is that you can measure a society about how it treats its women. Absolutely. So when Absolutely. you look at it from that point of view, yeah. then that makes a lot of sense. So when you look at the, in a very general way, when you look at the West, how are women treated? So when you look at the, the woman in the workplace, is she getting paid yeah. the same as men? No. Is she getting the top jobs? No. Um, in family home, you know, is she, is she being encouraged into work when maybe she doesn't want to go, you know, mm. are her benefits being, you know, cut back, th these kind of things, mm. isn't it? Mm. Um, you know, you have families who have to go on benefits and go to food banks, and, you know, supply that at the mm. same time in order to, you know, choose food over heating yeah. sometimes as well. So this is women in the West, women in the East, you know, we have the same kind of problems that, Absolutely. you know, basic rights, but also just being able to walk down the street. But when I look at women in, this, in Islamic history, mm. you can see that, you know, they're educated, they were honoured, they were, they were praised. And, yeah. Yeah. and when they, you know, they had those needs, that, you know, the, the people in charge, they would, the, the rulers, Umar Radi Anhu, as a ruler, would come in and actually fulfil those needs. One of the interesting yes, things that. that you were saying also was even when Islam is judged, it's judged by its treatment of women yeah. or how it views women. Yeah. 
and but there's a huge contrast between the pictures that you put up in bench drinking that women behaving in a certain way yet they attack a religion that treats its women with honor yeah. in a again that's criticized so there's there is no sort of okay what is the right way to be for women or what mm -hmm. is the right way to be treated for women mm -hmm. and everything is sort of criticized mm -hmm. when it comes to women so it sort of leads on nicely to our next article as well though doesn't it from Sultan. yes mm -hmm. um, I have an article from the the very popular five pillars website which is a Muslim news news site um, and the, uh, the title of the article is do Muslim women want to open the door to feminism um, and the writer Shahana Khan she talks about this new phenomena that has come come to the West which is Muslim organizations which are adopting the mantle of feminism so they're claiming that they are feminist Muslim organizations and she basically critiques this and what she makes some really valid points she talks about how um, does Islam first of all does it need another mantle like does Islam is something lacking fundamentally from Islam that it needs something to add, to be added to it and so she criti critiques that uh, rightly so and on top of that she talks about the roots of feminism and I Adam you were saying about history and how important it is to look at the history to understand even the present and I think that she very nicely uh, looks at feminism and the roots of it and she looks at the actual belief system of feminism mm. that its roots were in the West so it has a journey that took place and its narrative is pretty much a Western narrative this is where feminism was born from it may have been taken to our countries now and as a consequence of that it contains within it, within it lots of ideas which on the one hand could be contrary to Islam and on the other hand may agree with Islam but that 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 that's kind of inconsequential because on the one hand they may be saying that you are free to be a woman and to make choices in your life and to uphold those choices and all of that kind of thing on the other hand they may be saying that your hijab is oppressing you mm -hmm. and so forcibly we need to liberate you and we need to liberate you from the shackles of Islam so you know the, the whole discussion of the, the feminism doesn't really you know deal with those kind of mm -hmm. things it doesn't deal with that kind of um, in a conflicting viewpoint and for Muslim women to adopt therefore this this a new label of feminism what you know why do they need to adopt a label will it which itself within even the feminist genre you know thinking um, has so many different strands Absolutely, they are yeah. not themselves unified and therefore why are we um, removing something from Islam or are we adding something to Islam which Islam itself doesn't need because Islam mm. champions the rights of all people but according to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. and what he deems as justice and what he deems as fair and correct um, treatment. Um, and so therefore she kind of looks at this and says that, you know, are we just creating more problems for ourselves by adopting um, a new persona of feminism, which fundamentally, even in the West, many people critique it and say that it's it One issue worked. here, which is quite interesting that you've picked up, is the fact that Islam is a premise, yes. ultimately, and it comes as a whole system. Yes. And you've got feminism, which comes as a perspective, yes. and it could be also seen as a premise. So we have to ask ourselves exactly what is our premise, yes. for why, why we do what we do, what is the premise for wearing hijab, and that's very, very important, inshallah. Yeah. And it's also interesting to also note the fact that you've got different ways in which feminism is also articulated. Yes. So you've got the academic feminists yes. who might reinterpret, for example, specific texts, scriptural texts, yes. and then of course you've got grassroots activism. Yes. So as you say, it comes in different strands. Right. So we have to ask ourselves there's the argument that um, why does it matter so much yes. if feminism can also be a good thing? Because as you said, people, and one of the things Sister says is, is defined in so many ways by so many people. Absolutely. So it doesn't have to be the history that has attached to it. That is the argument. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. But um, especially if your um, feminism struggles for justice for women, rights for women, etc. But my argument here is, and my issue here is, you know the justice that you are struggling for Islam already gives you that it the honor that you're struggling for Islam already gives Audrey you that so why don't we just yeah. call it Islam why do we need to add Have feminism to, yeah. Islamic feminism or feminist Islam or whatever it is let's yeah. just call it Islam exactly well just for those articles and that in discussion as well we're going off for a short break but before that we have another exciting competition for you this week this week on Women's AM, we are holding an exciting competition for you sisters out there.